Is it live? Okay, it's live. Oke, okay, thank you everyone uh, joining. Uh, mungkin gue pakai bahasa Indo dulu. Um, thank you buat para peserta Skill Tree udah join. Um, hari ini kita kedatangan tamu uh, dari G23 atau G23. Um, mereka lebih ke spesialis buat empowering game studios. Which consists of veterans. So, veterans from Google, Animoca Brands, Cajun Gaming, Blizzard, you name it. And so this will be very good opportunity for you guys to ask as many questions as possible to this gentleman. So I think uh, Mark already came to start some uh, prepared materials or prepared slides for you guys to see and for you guys to learn about G23. Mark, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, first of all, thank you to AGI for, for, for hosting us. It's a real honor for, for me and the G23 team to chat to everyone today and talk through. So is, is, the, uh, is the presentation up on the, up on the screen? I think uh, in a moment. Yeah. Will be... Yeah, so just while the presentation comes up, we will do just a brief overview of uh, of G23, just for sort of 15 minutes or, or 20 minutes, introduce ourselves uh, as a team and our and our backgrounds, talk a little bit to uh, G G23 and, and what we do, and then some case studies of how we've helped um, mobile studios. And then we will utilize the vast majority of the time for the Ask Us Anything quest, uh, session. So we want you to really uh, throw as many questions at, at us as you can. So um, yeah, are, are, we, uh, are we up and running? Um, hopefully, still loading. <laughs> I think it needs a little Coming bit more time. time. Yep, it's up and running, Mark. Uh, Great, so, so I, spoke to, I spoke to most of this already. Brief introduction to, to the team, you know, talking around some mobile game market validation. Uh, growth strategies for studios that we think will be relevant for you guys. A little bit of an update on a new digital games tax offset in Australia uh, for new studios, which we think is relevant. Then talking about further resources and support from us, and, and then we will dive into the Ask Us Anything session, which will be the majority of the time. So th this is the team. Um, you know, we, we are senior leaders from the world's foremost gaming technology and consulting companies. Uh, you know, we, we've bridged the traditional gaming space right through to emerging Web3 and blockchain gaming as well. So my name is, is, is Mark Aubrey. I'm one of the managing partners here. I've been in the video games industry for, for over 20 years, most recently at Activision Blizzard. I was the managing director of the Asia Pacific business for Activision. I ran the end-to-end -end business, both for Activision Publishing and for Blizzard Entertainment across the region, including all mobile, PC, um, console, esports, all verticals uh, of the business. Prior to that, um, I spent some time in the casino gaming industry. I was also at Warner Brothers Games and, and was one of the early employees that built the Warner Brothers business. More recently, I've been in Web3 doing some strategic advisory and some work for the Saudi Games Group out of, um, out of Saudi Arabia as they build up their gaming assets as well, obviously alongside the work that we do here with G23. So I'll pass over to my colleagues to introduce themselves. Perhaps, um, David, do you want to, um, do you want to go next? <clears throat> sure. Thanks, Mark. Uh, hi, Joseph. Hi, everyone uh, watching on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, the name's David Yin. A bit of introduction on myself. I've been covering the Indonesia games market now for about 12 years, um, going back all the way back to the Nokia days. Um, so, you know, I have met and um, helped a lot of Indonesian game studios grow uh, in the last 10 to 12 years. My most recent role uh, was CEO of Storms uh, Gaming, as well as president of um, Web3 and iCandy. Um, so that was key focus there was uh, basically building and developing casual games. Um, we also published a game from an Indonesian game studio called uh, Niji Games. So we published uh, Umbra um, a couple of years ago on that. Um, and then I will also work closely with Joseph, who's a good friend uh, over at Joy Seed. We were developing jointly a Web3 game um, as well when I was at Storms and iCandy. So prior to, before 
before I can eat storms, um, I was the head of business development for Google Play uh, for Indonesia, um, Indonesia, Australia, and New Zealand, um, as well as high potential up and coming up and coming game studios in Southeast Asia. And then prior to that, mobile advertising startup for gaming, and then Nokia, as I mentioned. So very nice to meet all of you. I'll hand over to Hung, and then maybe Chris. Thank you, David. Hey, hey, everyone. Hey, Joseph, <clears throat> and everyone watching online. Um, my name is Hung. Uh, I'm a managing partner here at G23 as well. Uh, my background's a little bit different from the previous gentleman. Um, I, I was a software engineer, and then I spent um, a number of years as a management consultant at McKinsey and Company, focusing on telco, media, and um, and the entertainment sector. Um, and uh, after that, uh, ran some startups before getting deep into Web3 gaming back in 21, 22, um, and was uh, most most recently in, in, in that space, uh, the CMO of a company called Cathion Gaming or Soul Chicks, for those who um, know that uh, know that particular title, know that particular industry, um, and since then um, have have teamed up with the rest of the gentlemen here. Um, I also do a lot of um, fundraising and advisory for Web3 game projects, and I'm a venture scout with the Immutable Group as well, um, helping those guys find um, gaming partnerships and content for their for their um, uh, for, for for their ecosystem. Uh, so lovely to be here, and um, yeah, looking forward to chatting further. I'll hand it over to Chris. Thanks, Hung, and thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. I'm Chris Whiteman. I'm the fourth of the managing partners here at G23. Uh, my background is a little different as well. Uh, I'm a corporate and commercial executive uh, across a few different sectors, um, but I've been in gaming, involved in gaming for about five or six years now, uh, mostly uh, through my role as a non-executive director of Animoca Brands uh, and also their, their investment funds, Animoca Ventures and Animoca Capital. Uh, I'm also a, a non-executive director of iCandy Interactive, which is the, the company that David used to run um, out of Singapore uh, a few years back. Uh, so through so my, my um, expertise in gaming is, is more about the corporate commercial side, governance, um, some transaction sort of work um, and and joint venture structuring and um, along those sort of lines. So I think you can see from the, the background of the four of us, we, we've all got expertise in slightly different areas and, and we think it's very complimentary. So we're, we're, we're pleased to present here today. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So just a very brief overview uh, of, of some of the areas and some of the services that we do provide. So, you know, as Chris mentioned, across the skill sets of the team, um, we cover many uh, areas from mobile to console to PC publishing, Web 2 to Web 3, um, fundraising and, and capital raising, um, you know, so, so we pretty much cover cover the whole uh, gamut. So if we put those into, into four pillars, the first one really is around growth strategies, commercialization and market entry. So this is everything from regional and emerging market strategy in terms of entering new markets or thinking about how you optimize your studio operations in any, any given market, optimizing user acquisition and retention strategies, app store optimization or digital storefront optimization on on console or PC, live operation strategies, and then improving monetization through things like your ad network partnerships, in-app purchases, you know, tokenomics uh, strategies, if it's Web3, you know, right through to NFT mints or any of those areas. The second pillar is around cost reductions and operational efficiencies of, of the business and building capabilities. So this is thinking about how you can create very lean development processes and um, and gain access to reliable uh, Web2 and Web3 talent at, at cost effective um, costs. And then thinking about capability building or education programs around topics like Web3, live operations, emerging markets. The third one is fundraising um, leadership and M&A activity. We've got networks through some of the world's biggest VC um, funds and private equity funds with strong buy and sell um, experience. So we can support those activities as well as all uh, fundraising NFT mints in the, in the Web3 space. And then the final pillar is technology and people services. So we have a strong network of, of CTOs, both through 
partner studios and who used to report into us in, in, in previous roles. And we have uh, um, access to a lot of high quality development services across the region and the world that we can tap into uh, if required, as well as Web3 sport support. So it's just a very brief overview, um, you know, of the types of services that we provide that also, you know, we hope assist in the types of questions that you may want to, uh, you may want to ask as well. Next, David touched on this, but you know we have worked with some of the world's biggest studios and worked on some of the world's biggest IP. But as it relates specifically to Indonesia, um, we've also worked with some of the best studios uh, in Indonesia as well. So we have a very strong uh, expertise in that market. I might hand over to um, to David to then uh, run through this and then touch on a, a couple of case studies of how we've helped some studios in um, in the past. So David, do you want to jump in here? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah. So as Mark mentioned, um, you know, during my time uh, with with Google and, and also Nokia, um, you know, I've worked very closely with a lot of these studios. And as you can see, um, some of the largest game publishers in Indonesia with Lito and Megaraxis um, and, and also uh, Indofun. And then some of the indie studios and mid-sized studios as well, Agate, Own Games uh, and so on. So the key focus here was uh, basically, you know, focusing on growth and monetization uh, strategies with these in these studios as well. So very good friends also with a lot of these guys, you know, um, Rocky from Touch 10 and Eldwin from Own Games and, you know, Andy from Lito and so on. Um, so, you know, I, I guess the, the key point here is, uh, you know, we, we do know the Indonesia market very well um, and also the Indonesian game studios um, very well. Um, next slide, please, Mark. Yeah, so the the topic of um, you know of of today's uh, session is all around growth strategies, proven proven uh, kind of growth strategies for for studios, and what we've done here is um, we've kind of looked at it from a pre-launch uh, perspective as well as a post-launch perspective, um, and um, there are obviously similarities across both pre-launch and post-launch. So in terms of pre-launch, in terms of market validation, how do you how do you validate that the market is large enough or that particular genre is large enough uh, or that game is going to succeed in the market? So we, you know, we look at, um, you know, we advise and look at certain uh, areas here. So, uh, you know, you've got to really understand your monetization and content strategy really, really well. You need to have a think about your user acquisition and marketing strategy as well. Analytics is really, really critical. Now, whether this is Firebase analytics, um, you know, deep dive into your console and, you know, Google and, and Apple. Community building um, is, is especially critical on both Web 2 and Web 3. Uh, it's especially critical on the Web 3 uh, space as well. So, you know, what's the thought process around building the community from scratch, you know, influencers, um, you know, uh, social media presence um, and so on. Um, App Store partnerships are kind of um, critical there. Um, so, you know, whenever, you know, whenever there's an opportunity to meet with the Google and the Apple uh, folks over in uh, Indonesia or globally, I think that's really, really critical in terms of understanding what is the market validation as well as the growth strategies. Uh, audience type is important. Now, are you pitching towards the Web2 audience or Web3 audience? Um, it's vastly different uh, with the Web3 audiences, you know, your daily active users and your monthly active users doesn't have to be as significant and massive as your Web2 audience itself uh, for, for the game to succeed. Um, so those are the common sort of areas that um, studios should, should look at in terms of pre-launch and post-launch. There are some other areas with pre-launch that are not um, the same as both for pre-launch and post-launch. So other areas are doing your research, so carrying out your research, right? So looking at the Google Play Store, the Apple App Store, App Annie, or, you know, um, and so on, and really seeing, you know, what are the fast rises on the on the charts, right? What sort of genres are doing really well? What sort of games are rising really, really quickly, um, you know, on those charts? And then downloading those games, playing with those games, uh, looking at the monetization within the games, the game levels, um, how does it work, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, what are the gameplay mechanics um, as well? And then obviously heavy testing uh, is, is really, really important uh, for pre-launch. Now over on the post-launch side, once the game has launched, um, you know, live ops and, and major updates, having a solid roadmap for the next 18 months all the way to the 24 months is really critical. Just launching a game without having any thinking around 
one of the major updates coming over the next 12 to 18 months is really, really risky and really, really dangerous. There has to be a solid roadmap already um, in place to, to, for you to think about what are the updates coming. Uh, because, you know, fresh content is absolutely critical uh, when you're launching a game itself. Then have a think about, are you focusing only on the Indonesia market uh, or are you looking at global markets itself, right? So Indonesia itself, there have been very, very successful games in Indonesia. Uh, Tebak Gamba, uh, Tahu Bulat is, is examples of very, very successful games in Indonesia. Um, and and um, <clears throat> But obviously, global markets are massive and, and very large and they monetize really well as well. So thinking about whether it's local versus global is really important. Um, the quality of the game is something that is critical, right? So the quality of the game encompasses your Android Vitals, um, you know, your onboarding experience, your live ops, your UX, um, your user review ratings, and so on. So quality is absolutely key. Um, publishing opportunities. So once you've launched, there is also the chance of looking for a publisher to publish your game. So when I was at Storms, we published uh, a game from Niji Games. So, you know, that's that's an opportunity there to look at publishers as well. Um, and obviously, you know, um, it, that can also help you scale the game very, very quickly and lower your risk in terms of marketing costs. And um, fundraising options as well. You know, do you need to raise funds to to accelerate that growth as well? So th those are the key areas we're looking, where we, where we, we advise studios for pre-launch and post-launch. Um, next slide, please, Mark. Cool. Sorry, David. Oh, no, yeah. you're right. Okay, so what we have here is we just wanted to jump quickly into two case studies um, that you know G23 have been involved in in the past. Um, so this particular one is a you know um, is an Australian game studio, casual game studio based in Australia. And what we did here was focusing on growth and monetization strategy for this particular game studio. Um, and the overall results here were an increase of two times the average uh, revenue run rate within three months, right? So here we, you know, we, we looked heavily at the monetization strategy and then we executed that strategy with the studio itself. Now, what did we do here? Well, we looked at a few key drivers and a few key revenue levers here. So pricing strategy here. So diving deep into your, into the pricing um, strategy in terms of analysis here, what's your buyer rate? You know, what are your retention rate? What's your up down? What's your down versus, what's your down versus your mal? Um, and then looking at um, emerging market uh, pricing as well um, across the world and then advertising networks as well, you know, looking at what is your current ECPMs, uh, what should the benchmark market ECPMs be, uh, what's your up down based on ad revenues um, and so on. So and then another analysis or key lever here is your churn analysis, right? So looking within the game and seeing why do players churn within the game? Is it because of an achievement is not good enough? It wasn't strong enough, so they churn? Was it because, um, you know, they they bought an in-app purchase and then uh, didn't like it, didn't think it was good value for money and then churn? So that was something else that we did, a deep dive uh, player churn analysis. And also working very closely with Google and Apple uh, in terms of uh, pricing initiatives, uh, you know, thematic campaigns globally across the world. So all that led to a two times um, you know, 2x increase in, in average um, annual revenue uh, run rate there uh, within three months. Next slide, please, Mark. And then um, this was another studio in Southeast Asia. So what we did here was, um, you know, we helped the, the studio we, uh, and led the fundraising round for this studio. Um, and, you know, the, the initial thought was to just to raise funds, um, but that subsequently led to a full uh, acquisition uh, of $16 million for this uh, game studio publisher in Southeast Asia itself. So here we were looking at basically leading the, the, the fundraising uh, round, uh, you know, developing the pitch deck, uh, in outreach to investors, uh, pitching to, to banks uh, and um, banks and VCs, um, setting up the, the war room or the, or the um, you know, the due, due diligence room itself and the negotiations with investors and so on. So that led to an exit of 16 million for this uh, studio slash publisher in Southeast Asia, which was which was a which was a good result for us. Yeah. Next slide, please, Mark. 
Yeah, so this is quickly, um, the Australian government just passed legislation about a month ago um, on the digital games tax offset, the DGTO. So basically, you know, it's a tax offset of 30% for all eligible expenses uh, incurred by the studio. In some states as well, um, you know, you can get an additional 10 to 15% on top of the 30%. So you're looking at a total of 40 to 45% as a tax offset uh, for all eligible uh you know, uh, game expenses, including software engineering salaries, um, you know, um, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is basically, a, it, you know, it has to be a digital game. So most mobile games are digital games, and uh, it can be applied retrospectively in the past as well from July to 2022. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about the DGTO. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is um, this is our contact uh, email and the website itself. And for participants today, we're offering a free, not a free, we're offering a very heavily discounted, um, you know, consultation, fifty US for the for the first one hour meeting. It's heavily discounted from normally about five hundred dollars US per hour. Um, and there's a bit of literature there on the DGTO as well. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, next slide, please. Come on, yeah, so handing back to Joseph. Uh, so this is another probably 40 minutes for the Ask Us Anything session. I think Joseph will be moderating this session. So I'll hand back to Joseph. Thank you. So the, yeah, so there is an Ask Us Anything uh, sessions, but um, you can just ask on YouTube or maybe uh, Facebook if there is any. Um, there is also my WhatsApp there. Uh, please don't spam me with all, uh, all the marketing. So just, just spam me with all the uh, questions. Okay. okay, so I think um, we can let uh, Dina or the operators to bring up uh, if there are any questions from the YouTube site. Okay. I think um, we're still waiting. If there is none, maybe I do have some of um, some of the questions prepared for you guys. So you, you guys might want to freely answer by any of you guys. So I think um, first question, um, you guys are tackling a lot of mobile games, right? And um, in Google or Apple, um, you, you usually uh, rely on featuring. People rely on uh, their games or their apps get features on those on this store. And what do you think of these uh, features? Is it still worth it to uh, get featured by Google or Apple because like um, a lot of featuring right now it's um, actually um, crafted towards certain algorithms right certain um, um, desires for each its individuals so do you think it, it is still um, the way to go for all the mobile gaming uh, studios to get featured is it the is it the only way to get uh, free UA so-called to, to get uh, all the user or to get the new data? What do you think? Um, so I think I'll take this one, guys. Um, so, so I think the the short answer is, um, you know, the Play Store featuring uh, on both Google and Apple, you know, is not as is not as impactful um, as as it used to be a few years ago. Um, you know, it's it's becoming a lot harder to get featured um especially on on both stores and you know i speak from a google play store perspective um side it's it's a lot harder to get featured now there's a lot stronger focus on quality the concept of quality um for for the games itself you know life ops ui ux um you know um you know android vitals and you know user user reviews as well um so although it's a lot harder to get featured the once you do get featured um the impact is still pretty good uh you do you know you do see a spike in your in your downloads and and uh, subsequently your your revenues on ads and iaps as well but i, I would say that the the impact has is, is not as great as as it was before and also the second thing is it's a lot more crowded now than it was a few years ago in terms of the number of games out in the on the store um so overall i think the feature is is, is not as impactful but it's still pretty powerful as well yeah i see so for example if um there is someone that already made a games for four months and maybe they want to go early access so what are the 
I think the best steps for them to get the early data as um, something like day one retentions, uh, the conversion rate, and all that, uh, except from a, a from a featuring perspective. What is uh, your advice to them? Um, I mean, I can, I guys, I'll, I'll take this one as well. Yeah. So I think I think I can advise more from a you know indie games, casual games sort of thing, probably casual genre. Um, mm -hmm. Mark can probably advise more on a on a trip on a triple A hardcore sort of um, game level, but from an indie sort of casual games itself, in terms of early access or pre-launch, um, you know, casual games day one, anywhere between thirty-eight to forty-two percent day one, um, day seven, you know, eighteen to twenty-two, and then all the way dropping down to about seven to ten on day twenty-eight. Those are the sort of retention metrics that are that are really really good, um, and then. You know the retention for me is, is is the heart of every successful game it, you've got to have that good retention rates there now in terms of getting part of the early access program with google and apple um that one there you know it, it, once again it's it's not easy but you know uh you can reach out to the to the play store the the two you know app store apple app store and google play store to, to try to get in that program itself which is quite powerful um mm -hmm. but in terms of metrics itself i think those are the retention uh rates that i that i think are uh, are, are good um, that then leads to very good monetization rates itself. Um, Mark, I don't know whether you want to add anything on the on the hardcore kind of mid core. Look, it, it, the retention rates would be slightly higher as you would expect in a in a in a mid core hardcore game. You would probably want you know a, a, a you know that that day one closer to around that fifty percent mark. But that's natural. You're getting larger numbers into casual games. So with mid core products, you're expecting them to be a little bit stickier and in order to get players in and be able to retain them. So each of those metrics I would act actually add maybe only five percent, still pretty similar. And then as David said, around that around that profiling, it is around establishing those those relationships. It's not an easy thing to do, but it is it is it is important and trying to then get those featuring it's obviously with a more mid-core product or a um or a higher end AAA product those things in terms of getting featuring are obviously easier but that's a huge part of the process of getting that early um that early exposure and those early downloads into in into into games but otherwise it's pretty similar to, to everything david mentioned i see so maybe as you um as you maybe haven't really noticed a lot of Indonesian uh, gaming studios have moved from um, some um, some of them are still in free to play, but most of them are moving into like premium games. So they are, they are selling the games on Steam uh, because on um, how tough free free to play market can be, and how do you think these people can win the free to play market, especially the these Indonesian studios that we don't really have quite a lot of resources to to go against this kind of giants in the in the free to play market that have a lot of ua right so is this still an option for us uh, to to win those market the free to play market is this still a hope to that look i i there'll be different there'll be different perspectives on on this but i can sort of i can take an initial stab at it i still think that Free to play has obviously become hyper competitive. There's so many free to play games out there, and it's a and it's a it's a pretty much an all or nothing scenario, right? Because being free to play, unless you can create really rich, engaging experiences that drive monetization, you're putting resources and energy into into products that you're not getting a not getting a return on. I mean, again, I'm coming at this from a perspective of 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 premium products, but if I look at if I look at examples of for instance what happened with call of duty so for years you would know call of duty was a premium experience right and it was only a premium experience and it was and it was huge but the introduction of warzone so the introduction of the free-to-play component of call of duty like bought 10 times the amount of players into the game and more than tripled the amount of revenue that we generated from Call of Duty. It went from a $1 billion business to a $3 billion business. So getting that formula right, it, 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 it can be hugely successful. And I mean, you know, you're obviously talking about one of the biggest game franchises that exists, but if you're thinking about a solid premium experience, it doesn't, I think that experience shows it doesn't need to be 
either or. If you can think about a premium experience that drives a core fan base, but then you can think about a lighter experience that enables a trial or enables people to come in and build out your community of players, um, then 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 that can be that can be successful. Um, but yeah, it's a it, it, it's a, it is a very very difficult balance because the risk you run on going down that free to play path is that you are you're not generating ever any revenues and you're doing it within a very competitive landscape. Um, David, was there was there anything else from from you on that? Yeah, no, I think um, just to just to add as well, uh, Mark and, and Joseph, I think um, when you're moving from free to play to a premium uh, environment over at Steam. It's it's not a it's not a simple transition to make, right? I mean, when, mm. when you when you're when you're developing a game that is a free to play game, the mechanics of the game and the monetization of the game is completely different versus a premium game, um, you know, over at the Steam side. So I think, I think that, um, and your what you said, Joseph, is true as well because I'm seeing this globally. You know, we're seeing this globally as well that there is a move towards premium games on Steam, right? Because it's too crowded in the mobile space and so on and so forth. But I think what's really important is that migration path or that migration strategy, if it's the same game or even a new game, the thought process from free to play versus premium is 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 challenging. It's it's really, really tricky, right? Um, so I think I think that's the first thing. And I think the second thing is, you know, mobile mobile gaming free to play, I think still it's still growing, um, although it's been a bit flat since uh, COVID, but it is still growing and there are still great games coming through the pipeline. Um, and, you know, specific, specifically in Indonesia, there has been, you know, a few very, very strong hit games in, you know, in the past, which I mentioned, Tabagamba, Gamba, Tau Bulat, and so on um, so forth. Yeah. I see. So to, to summarize um, your guys' point is like, it's okay to go premiums, uh, but then uh, to transition from premiums to free to play there's still a work to do but uh, you can try if you already have like a premium game that has a lot of audience that has a lot of community and you can utilize that for the free to play games is that is that the nuance that you guys are giving yeah i i think i think you can utilize um you can utilize a print if you are successful in in creating a premium experience and building a community then the introduction of a free-to-play experience alongside that can absolutely expand your audiences to new to new groups of players. But the points David raised are, are very are very um, are very good ones because premium games are typically more expensive to make. Um, they're longer to make. The development timelines are longer. The quality parameters around them are, are, are longer are longer as well. So you know it is not without its risk as well. And if I actually look at the broader um, investment landscape of even premium premium games publishers and premium game studios nearly exclusively when they're looking to where they're going to grow next they're actually mm -hmm. looking to mobile and they're looking to mobile and they're looking to free to play experiences so to david's point i still think that this is a this is a huge growth area with lots of opportunity attached to it i see okay i think we have uh, one questions on the board um Okay, so this is, uh, it's from Luki. Do you have any valuable tips for or advice for indie game developers who are working with a limited budget and seeking effective strategies for user acquisition? So it's a question of user acquisitions. Did you want me to take that one? I think I'll, I'll have a... I'll, yeah, I, I'll I, I can add to it, David. If you kick off, I can, I can add a couple of thoughts to it as well. Yeah, so I think... Um, this question probably for me has has two parts to it. Um, I'm assuming here when you say limited budget, um, there is still some budget, although it's not a massive amount of budget, right? So I'm assuming that if there is a limited amount of budget to spend on paid user acquisition, that's the first part of the answer. Then what's really, really key here is um, once again, you know, ensuring that your long-term value LTV is greater than your CPI, right? Which means that your return on advertising spend has to be greater than 100%. Now, how do you make that happen? That's very, very hard to do, which is very, very heavily focused on your retention rates, your day one, seven, 14, 28, and so on, and your monetization around that. So lots and lots of testing, uh, fine tuning the game, even potentially you know, changing the game or adding a lot more levels, making it more complex. But it's very hard to nowadays um, embark on unprofitable user acquisition um, uh, strategies. So that's the first part. The second part in terms of limited budget, um, 
it, I think that the second part in terms of limited budget is focusing obviously on organic growth. So where can you, um, you know, where can the, the studio actually get organic growth from, right? So there's a couple of ways of, of looking at this. Um, so some of the some of the organic channels um, that are normally, you know, in the past have advised on is Facebook groups to, to test those games, to download the games and start playing the games. Um, and then if they love the games, they can, you know, tell their Facebook communities, their Facebook friends about the game itself. Um, getting onto global kind of communities as well um, is a second one. Discord now, the Discord channels and, and the Discord community now for gaming is pretty massive and growing as well. Um, and then obviously, you know, uh, being involved, you know, with, with a lot of hopefully, you know, Play Stores, uh, App Stores and, and Google Play Store and Apple App Store as well. If you can speak to them and they, they like your game, there's always this um, new games that they really focus on. They like fresh content. So that's kind of a quick summary on 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 the, um, that question for me yeah yeah the the i think they're good points the only other the only thing that i would add to that um with limited budgets and thinking about that i was also going to touch on organic growth but driving organic growth via um via targeted influencer strategy so trying to think about um what are the markets that you believe you can penetrate the the easiest? I mean, if that's local, if that's Indonesian markets or if Southeast Asian markets, or if you think that the opportunity is actually greater in North America or in another market, then be very targeted in where you think that um, that those opportunities are. And then targeted sort of influencer influencer strategies. Now with that, you don't you you can't put budgets around, you know, AAA influencers with millions of followers, but you can, there are tools and there is software that you can use things like tubular for instance where you can understand who up and coming influencers are that would be much more cost effective that you could either do via small marketing spends or you could even think about a marketing attribution program so if those influencers lead to click through and monetization in your product then the influencer is rewarded that way so that's another that's another mm -hmm. way that you could drive some um, some some organic growth uh, with a with a limited limited budget I think that's really answered the questions. And uh, so, so to summarize all of those, we need to um, really efficiently um, choose our target market where we can penetrate. And if, if, if it's not UA, then we need to do the organic. There is a lot of way to do the organic ways. And um, there's Discord, Facebook, and all that. It just needs to, uh, the game contents to be engaged for the right target market. Is that the, the nuance that you guys want to give? OK, cool. Okay, I, I want, um, if there is no question on the board, I, I might still have a lot of questions. So uh, right now is, um, is the question of Web3. So you guys are, are still in the, in the uh, Web3 spaces as well. You guys are working or helping a lot of uh, Web3 companies to do that. So what do you think of like um, things happening in the Web3? Because right now, uh, all the crypto market is uh, still going down and um, there's a lot of um, pessimistic kind of nuance uh, surrounding the Web3 itself. So do you think it's still a thing for a Web3 gaming to be like born in this time and maybe like build? And if if yes, then how to, to tackle uh, some of those um, difficulties? Yeah, I, I can take a crack at those ones, guys. So, it's, uh, so to give uh, David and Mark a bit of a break. Um, Look, I think it's, um, I mean, I think your observations are right, right, Joseph, like it's probably, it's, you know, we've probably come down from the heady highs of sort of like Web3 gaming excitement from the, from the past years. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a, it's definitely a tougher space, right? I think um, uh, from a, from a fundraising perspective, it's a, it's a tougher space. I think from a macro perspective, you know, we all know that fundraising is tough, but also, from a Web3 gaming perspective um, in particular, you know, we've seen a lot of VCs sort of like invest in Web3 games over the past um, year or two. And, and what that means is they're also just over-indexed on sort of like, you know, exposure to Web3 gaming. And so in that space, it means it's you know, doubly difficult for Web3 games to be sort of like um, uh, who, who, who need money to be, to be looking for that money right now. And, um, you know, there are alternative ways to... Um, uh, to, to look for funding and so forth and grant for like things like grants and other, and other things like that. Um, but you know, there's, there's no doubt that that's difficult in terms of like the second part of your question, which I think is more around like the longer term future of web three gaming. Um, 
you know, I think I think the 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 concept of Web three gaming is sort of evolving, um, and I think the I think that um, de, you know there will be a role to play for Web three gaming. It just depends on how 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 big and how fast we we get there, um, and I think. Right now, you're, 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 for, for most people who are aware of that space, you know, there's more of a focus on the actual game itself, right? I think the previous generation of Web3 games, there was this, there was this sort of like um, view that the, the token or the, the, the currency was almost the product, right? And people lost focus that the game was the product and, and, and we saw a lot, of, a lot of games being developed with the, with the focus on the currency, whereas now, you know, the focus is much more on the game. Um, and I think, that that's the right move. I think it also brings the industry closer to the gaming industry than than just the crypto, than just the than finance just the crypto, than just the finance industry. Correct or this this the, the I, I wouldn't even call it finance. It's just the, I would say the game the gambling speculative sort of industry. Yeah. <laughs> space, state rice Joseph. So I think there's um I think that's a good move for the industry. I think that 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 you know there's still there still will be sort of like that 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 long term. Uh, there will it will be you know part of the long-term future of of gaming um i think the products need to be sort of improved i think the other challenge is um while we're talking you know uh, while we're while we've got these guys here you know the the the, the um challenges around sort of like distribution are also yeah. sort of like the next challenge in my mind right like we've talked about steam we've talked about google play store and apple and apple store here and um they've made some small movements but in actual fact like you know web3 games are just at a, at, a, at a huge disadvantage when just competing with web two games on an even um on 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 an even um uh distrib on on even sort of like distribution channels right like web three games you're not you don't find them on steam you gotta you gotta google yeah. them and, and go to some obscure part of the internet and um yeah. and and connect your wallet and hope everything works right um and so there are those sorts of challenges as well so um and then in the, and then in the near term there's no doubt that like you know if you're if you're really looking for for, for for people right now, to be honest with you, like you don't, you, it's it's quite a challenging audience to. You're dealing with a lot, a, a smaller audience, uh, a smaller target audience right now, right? So, mm. um, with a Web three game, your your addressable sort of like player base is right now not as high, um, and so you really have to have conviction, sort of like long term, that um, that what you're doing is going to work. Um, so yeah, so that that's sort of that's sort of the the summary. Hopefully that touches on the points, but I'm happy to take any follow ons in case um there was any other questions that you had and 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 also if anyone else on the panel wanted to address the question yeah i think yeah. i think i think just to add as well um hung and joseph i think for, i think for me um and, and i think joseph and i were you know spent a lot of time thinking about this question as well right yeah. uh, when we were working together quite closely and i think that the key is um building a game building a web3 game that doesn't doesn't seem or look like a web3 game is, is really important. So the gamers, you know, gamers don't even know that they're playing a Web3 game, right? So they're actually playing a Web2 game, but then you have the Web3 uh, gaming overlays uh, around it when you go and purchase an in-app, when you go and purchase an in-app item, the payment uh, methods could be, you know, it could be it could be credit card, it could be, you know, token billing, and then bang, cryptocurrency or, or some sort of token there. Um, and then, you know, smartly having prompts throughout the gameplay saying, hey, you know that you bought this particular shield or this particular NFT, now it's actually worth quite a bit more, you know, three or four times. Do you want to trade that in the market, you know, and sell it to your friends or whatever? So I think, I think, um, you know, having a game, a Web3 game that doesn't look and feel like a Web3 game, I think is also quite important for the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So I, I do have a follow up. So, so um, recently I, I watched some uh, podcast from um, I think Mathcast. I think it's it's from Navi. So one of the podcasts they're actually covering uh, Web three games uh, studios called Azra Games. If um, if you're familiar with, um, and their approach of the Web three gaming is actually just to separate uh, the Web two players and the Web three players all together. So they have their own game. So meaning it's like the, the Web3 players, they only have a, a gamification of monetization layers. So all the, uh, because all, all of the DGENs, they, they only have, they only um, really pursue the earnings instead of the, of the fun. And, uh, and the, for the Web2 players, they, they don't care about the earnings at all. And they just care about the fun. So what do you think of this approach? Yeah, so I've, I've got some thoughts on it. So first of all, I think like, um, 
that way to introduce Web3 features, I think is probably the right way to go about it, right? So don't shove it down people's throats um, in your game. Uh, make it an option to take up in a very seamless way if people want to do it, right? It's it's not just in gaming. It's also sort of like the concept that um, I think it was, it might have been Instagram or, or Twitter or one of them. You know, they, they, were, they were trying to in introduce NFTs onto their platform, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they made it an opt-in approach, right? Hey, for people who don't care about it, it doesn't matter. It's still the same Instagram experience, but if you want it, um, here it is, right? And so... Uh, and, and so that sort of that that that, that sort of approach um, is 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 one way you can start introducing it without alienating your existing audience, which I think is a big concern, right? Because the bigger audience is definitely the mass gaming audience, right? It's the mass social media audience. So that's one part. The second the second part on that though that I'll that I'll that I'll mention, and um, you know, and 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 by the way, I'm sure the Azra guys are you know they're, they're a super smart group of group of people over there, right? Um, the second part that I will mention though is I think. Uh, something that 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 needs to be carefully managed is the implications on Web two gamers by from introducing these Web three features, right? So like un unintended consequences, whereby you have a player group um, who are motivated by very different things affecting the the reason why the original players are playing the game, right? So it's the it's the uh, so I know so. You know, I know Mark used to work for Activision Blizzard, so uh, but I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna talk about Diablo three, right? It's that sort of hey, you know, we, you build a fun, the the challenge is you build a fun game and you introduce a, you, you introduce something external that could affect the core gameplay, and that itself has has risks, right? The the, the challenge of Web three gaming is like without Web three, if you have a closed economy, you actually don't have the same risks that could undermine the actual fun of the game, right? As soon as you introduce sort of like um, an open economy and you introduce speculation and all those sorts of things, all of a sudden you have these, you, sure there's upside, but there's also challenges in in, manning, in managing those aspects of the game. Um, and there's also a new risk, which is that, hey, if you do it, if you do it improperly, all the hard work that you've put into creating a fun game could actually be undermined by this new, by this, by this new behavior that you're incentivizing um uh, by, by by opening up um, these these sorts of features right so mm. that's the that's the other thing that I'll that I'll say right it's 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 just um you know uh, people really should be wary about that part of web 3 and I, and honestly I don't think enough advice is 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 sort of like provided to to game developers on that side in terms of like understanding the cost and the risk of doing this properly um rather i think like a lot of the services like oh yeah we'll fix your economics we'll, we'll fix your tokenomics for you we'll fix that for you and then the question should be i do i really should i really even be doing it right like help mm -hmm. me understand the sort of like implications around what this means for my game and help me make the decision around like you know whether this is something i should really be doing or not and i think that's something that um at g23 right you, you know we 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 have a we 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 um we really provide like a, a an impartial view on because you know we I don't have I don't have to push Web three if it doesn't if it doesn't make sense right um, yeah. because of all the other services we can provide but um that's that's something I'm a little bit critical of in terms of like how how a lot of that stuff has been implemented and how that how the demand for that service has been um has evolved so mm -hmm. I hope that helps yeah just before you summarize Joseph can I I just add like a from a higher level perspective that. I mean, I probably I've got my Animoca bias on, but the the concept that digital asset ownership is going to continue to gather momentum, you know, in the medium term, like I'm pretty confident that that's that's the way it's going to go. But it might not make people money in six months, twelve months, or eighteen months, or it might it might take a couple of years. So I think like you've got this you know, movement towards Web three. Does it happen in six months, twelve months? It doesn't mean you don't set yourself up for it and like hung saying mm. you, you can start to introduce and david saying introduce web3 elements and then by the time the mass market is ready for it or you know the the um the onboarding with wallets and so forth is simplified and people are much more comfortable now then i think you're going to get this explosion in in usability of web3 gaming so that just from a higher level perspective like i have i have a lot of confidence in the medium term I, I, I mean, just just to add to that, because so so do I. I mean, I, I still we know from gaming behaviors how much time, effort, energy, and attention players put into building their 
building their digital items, wanting digital ownership. We know that trading happens already outside the yeah. gaming ecosystem and it's worth billions of dollars. And so no one's figured out yet, you know, what the things that Hung mentioned around how you create a circular economy where you don't create hyperinflationary pressure. And these are all the things that still need to be need to be sorted out. But I remain convinced that you know, the benefits of blockchain, the benefits of how you create smart contracts behind user generated content, the benefits of being able to buy, sell and trade digital assets in a in an ecosystem where the publisher shares in that revenue, but do it in a way where it doesn't break the game economy. That's evolutionary for the video games business. I, I mm. I'm very buoyant on, on web three, but it just we haven't we are still sorting out exactly how how the model will work. But I think when it when it does get started to when it is sorted out, um, Web3 will escalate and it'll escalate quickly. Yeah, I think I, I want to touch, touch on that as well, because like um, we all agree that um, it is somewhat in the future. Uh, so people are playing a long game. So in the meantime, or they're playing a long game, there is not a lot of uh, product market fit that's happening in the Web3 itself. So most of them consider success if there is um, uh, some fundraising, a uh, success fundraising is going on from a really um, famous VCs like A16Z. So in that part, I want to touch on uh, G23 part of uh, fundraising part. So what, what do you what do you guys have? Um, do you guys have any advice on how to raise fund uh, in tokens or maybe like in the, the Web3 spaces uh, where where the market is tough right now? It's a bear market. So uh, what do you guys think? Any advice? Yeah, look, it, it, I, the, the guys around here will all have a view on this, but we've got very strong contacts and experience across the, the Web3 space, the, the VC space, including Web2 and Web3. I mean, including the guys at the likes of A16Z and Griffin and, and those games. And Web3 projects, it, it has it has become more challenging, but it's become more it's become challenging because so much stupid money was thrown at Web3 projects that shouldn't have had money thrown at them. And, and now there is a different level of rigor that's going behind the assessment of a Web3 game, but good projects are still getting funded. And so I think it is being able to build a pitch deck and build a case that shows what you are doing that is unique and what you are doing to kind of build a, a game, what type of talent you have working on that game. And those types of projects are still gaining uh, are still gaining traction. Um, you know, I don't know the rest, the other guys, if you want to weigh in. Yeah, uh, I can, I can add a few thoughts. Um, I think, I think in in general, um, I think I like I said, I think it's a tough market, and I think like what happens in a tough market is investors, regardless of your professional or private or so forth, you know, your risk tolerance decreases, and that also means um, it also means the earlier you are in that sort of um, game development cycle, um, the the uh, you, you you the the actual threshold for risk it just gets it just gets removed, right? So, you know, previously in in, in Web three, um, you know, you could you could raise off off a promising idea because no one was really there yet, and it was a different time in the market, and off you'd go. Um, right now, I think my my general sort of view is, you know, um, regardless of you doing tokens or equity, you know, uh, uh, not 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 having a product in the market. Not having some sort of like um, evidence of traction or product market fit of of, of retention and 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 the like um, just makes it very difficult to raise, right? So that the 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 threshold, the, the the lowest threshold, has actually been increased, right? So if you actually don't have those sorts of things, unless you've got an incredible team with like you know stellar stellar background, you know. Um, 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 huge credentials and, and reputation and so forth. You know, it's it's just very hard to raise without getting to well, professional or you know that that professional and public money without getting to that point obviously under that you know you might still go for family and friends and and so yeah. forth and and you know that's that's sort of up to the individuals to go and go and sort of like um mostly utilize the networks to go and sort those things out um the other thing i'll, I'll mention is like um my sense is like token uh, you know token raises are still quite challenging um i think they've come come back a little bit but i think i think overall you know um what i'm what i'm seeing is that especially for games and that people understand the, the 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 life cycle of game development the time it takes to actually get something of quality out to the market you know people most people 
um, who, who still do this, do this sort of thing realize it's like, you know, there's there's no sort of like short term liquidity, the, the, you know, the, the, the short term liquidity benefit you get from tokens versus like the actual longer life cycle, long, long development life cycle of gaming actually conflicts a bit. And so like, you know, there's the people are in naturally just looking more towards like equity style raises can be equity with token warrants and so forth. But that's sort of like that's sort of like more of the theme, more, more of the theme um, in terms of in terms of like where 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 more of the money is um, is going at the moment. I see. Uh, on, on touch, um, additional to that, um, there is, um, yes, there is a VC funding, but there is also a plan for maybe some of uh, Web3 companies who want to do uh, public uh, public selling, so like IDO or yep. ICO yep. or any, any advice that you want to give like uh, to these people that <laughs> maybe wants to go in this, in this route? Yes, you yeah. we might be tackling that um uh, tokens might not be a, a good option for for pcs yeah. right now or um, yeah for for some yeah. maybe they have tokens and uh, what do they do yeah i mean i'll i'll, I'll sh look I'll, I'll share my thoughts right um i guess it depends look uh, you know if you're if you're sort of like <clears throat> if you're sort of um committed to a token raise strategy um there are some things in my view that still apply, right? Um, Cause you can still do token raises from, from professional private, private um, markets or public markets. Right. So uh, first of all, like the, the, my, 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 my views around sort of like having a product, having, having more progress in your, in your game, in your company still applies. Right. So um, uh, people who are still investing in tokens, like they're a bit more sophisticated now, right. They've, they've gone through some of these cycles. They know, you know they, they they can spot sort of like potential you know the, they can they 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 can um assess the risk of um these sorts of projects um better right because they've been through a few of these cycles and so like my my, my comments around sort of like having something that's already there having 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 you know showing like real progress um to to differentiate you from you know some of the projects that i just promise to me that's really important the other thing the other thing that, that to consider if you're going through a, a a token raise versus like a VC raise is um and, and you're focusing on public markets is that um in my view those sorts of raises actually require a, a, a bigger focus on marketing and 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 potentially like a less uh, and as a trade off a less a lesser focus on um I would say game development right just non marketing things right like you know um, in the traditional in in whatever traditional vc like you know uh the the the, the focus on sort of like how, how big your socials are how engaged your socials are um signals around the hype of your particular product are less relevant um if you go down the token route um there's 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 no doubt that like you have to invest more on that part of um uh of 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 the company right and um uh, and to me that that's also not easy right for, for anyone who's done any sort of community building before um uh it's it's uh it, it can be faked very easily but likewise you know the 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 sophistication of people who invest in these these sorts of things to identify whether you've truly got a a excited community a committed community versus versus a um a fake community for to, for lack of a better word um is is a lot more obvious right so like the the effort that's involved in getting that part of your business up to a state where you can have like an effective raise is also, you know, not, not, uh, is something that, you know, um, you, you really want to consider is something that, Hey, do, do, is that, is that where you want to put your, put your effort, um, in order to get like a successful token raise, uh, completed. Um, and so that's, that's a difference between obviously going that route, um, versus like, a, mm. a VC route. I see. Okay, I think um, I don't know if there's more questions on the board. Probably um, no. <laughs> um, one, I think one more questions regarding the the um, fundraise or, or token raise. Um, I think um, there is a lot of um, things that you, you say it's about marketing and it's about narrative and it's about like maybe hype building or formal building. Do you, do you, um, do you guys also specialize on 
on that. I mean, like uh, does G23 also specialize on, you know, oh, this is the hype building that, that the, the, the trends that is going on. So if you do this, then, then maybe you have a bigger chance to win the IDOs or you get chance to, to have your uh, token sold out on the public sales. So what, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, I, I can start with that. Like, um, yeah, it's it's definitely something that we offer. Um, uh, I would say it's it's uh, you know hype, hype hype building, I guess, is one one term, right? But I think more it's like you know we we can we can discuss how how to how to properly build your community. Um, and I think honestly, community building I think is misunderstood a lot of the time, Joseph. I think a lot of people you know either either say oh you know if you if you do inorganic community building, you're doing it. You're doing it wrong. I only want organic community building, and that's also wrong, right? Um, the, the 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 recipe, the process to actually build a community properly, is um, is is, is um, you know one that that we're experienced with, and 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 the whole the whole idea is at the end of the day, you still you still need to build a genuine community, right? Because if you don't, then 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 it, when it comes to the rubber hitting the road, when it comes to raising, when it comes to people playing your your game using your product it's it's not going to convert and eventually you'll get found out anyway but um look that is that is something that um that that, that also we can support on um yep. uh, i think i think between us we've actually um we've actually we've actually grown communities up up to like 500k a million and I'm, I'm not saying those are you know those those were obviously in previous generations as well i don't think that, that those numbers are necessary nor do i think a lot of the time that was that was genuine but in terms of like you know um building building engaged communities um, that's something we can we can support all right. Um, thank you for for that insight. I think we we've come to the end of um, of skill three. So uh, I want want to say thank you for uh, all of your participations, Mark, David, Chris, Hank. So I think uh, it really does help a lot from um, Indonesian gaming perspective to know uh, what is the uh, global industry is thinking. So I think uh, to be if if someone have further questions. Um, if you guys already screenshot my numbers, please do so, but don't spam me with the marketings. I will go straight away to, to David to um, uh, go with the questions. If you have any more questions about G23 as well, you can also go to me or I think uh, Fabrianto email is also on the, on the list. Um, so you can um, get in touch with them through me or, um, or to Fabri. Okay. I think that's all for today, guys. Um, thank you for coming, and see you when I see you. Maybe in Australia. Thanks, thanks, Joseph. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you. Bye.